Okay, are we live? We are. Oh, great. Oh, I see the number of participants just go up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 11 Texas State International Piano Festival Faculty Question and Answer Forum. Look at this lineup that you're seeing on screen right now. This is just wonderful. And, you know, if you're counting how many boxes you see, make sure you count two for Dr. Rackers and Dr. Lomazov over there and we're coming in from three different countries right now we have representatives from canada south korea and of course here in the u.s so so good to see a lot of you guys let me tell you how this is going to work a lot of you guys have already submitted questions to me so i'm going to read some of those questions if we have time at the end we will uh take feel more questions using the question and answer uh question and answer uh, button you see over there at the bottom. So with that, let's get started. We had a question that was submitted earlier. This one says, have you ever worked with management agent? What do they do? How did you find them? That's actually a very good question. Can we start that with Dr. Robotkina, our associate director? Have you ever worked with management? Oh, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> yes, I have. It happened to be at a very timely moment of my life and my career when I just entered a doctorate program in Rochester at Eastman School of Music. And I won Concert Artist Guild that September. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was a while ago. Um, I've learned a lot from them. I think uh, I was much more ready for them than I would have been five years prior to that. So I think it's very important at what point you cultivate uh, this connection. It can be really good, but you have to be ready. Oh. And what have I learned is that you have to have a hell of a stamina to be ready with several concert programs, to adjust to changes. That was not something that was easy for me, but I learned that you have to communicate with audience and establish those connections. And that you really have a lot more going on after uh, you part ways, if you part ways with the management, because you still have all these connections and you really know better what to do uh, in terms of personal uh, communication. Excellent. Thank you. Can I ask the same question, maybe perhaps to Dr. Lomazov? I know she also has an agent. Um, yes. Um, well, um, I participated in a few competitions and never really had an idea that um, somebody would sign me on. I mean, that was like way beyond my wildest dreams. Um, just wanted to gain some experience performing, but at one of the competitions, I it was William Capel actually, I didn't even advance to the finals, but there was this gentleman who liked my playing mm. in the semifinals. And he, you know, he started talking to me and he wanted to represent me and he specialized in representing young, just starting out. And he had a whole sort of roster of that. He actually, at that, point was also representing Cleveland competition, Cleveland National Piano Competition. So she, he had a whole um, roster of, of presenters that he was working with, and he was working with young pianists. So it was actually a, a good fit. So I, I really didn't know anything about, you know, how to deal with management. Um, but I remember we talked for about six months before both of us kind of made the plunge and signed on to each other. I think he was just as uh, wary of me as I was of him. <laughs> but but we decided that we'd try it out and we actually stayed together for uh, almost 20 years. And then about halfway through, um, Joe um, signed with him and Jonas you know, signed as a duo. And I have to say, overall, um, I don't think all management is perfect. Um, but he took, I think, was it 20%? He takes 20% of the fee, but he gets you a 20% larger fee than you probably would have gotten for yourself. 
Mm. And you subtract travel expenses from that. And it's kind of standard. I don't know, maybe the industry is different now, but that's what it was. And um, he would probably get, you know, 10 to 20 concerts for me um, over over a period of one year. Uh, would be more than I would ever try to get for myself. And I, I, I mean, I loved it. I loved the idea of just going and playing a concert and like Daria said, connecting with the audience and making lifelong connections. Um, it was a really, really great experience and really builds your repertoire. Um, there are a lot of things I would kind of do differently. Like he got me a lot of radio shows in the beginning um, and I was so not prepared to go on a live radio. And I wish somebody would tell me, please be more prepared, Marina, because it's going to be broadcast live. I remember looping through the Shostakovich fugue like three times before I got out of its final. It was like a bad dream. <laughs> Thank God it was Shostakovich fugue because nobody noticed. <laughs> Ina Felix was uh, listening to it. She's like, well, I thought it was great. I said, did you not notice that I was like looping through the same thing over and over again? Wow. No, no, it, was, it sounded great. So, Yeah, um, I, I agree with everything Marina said. I think um, ideally the manager brings a lot of connections that the pianist doesn't have. And a manager also works with the connections the pianist does have to maybe get more favorable terms for concerts that come in. So that can be um, very useful. So we've been with our manager for uh, 15 years. He's the same manager that Roberto Plano has. And um, so, uh, you know, it can be, a, can be a really good thing. Wow. Thank you very much for your answer. Oh, let me move on to the second one. This one is always a very interesting one, especially for our faculty. We really do span many, many generations over here too. We have very young pups and we have people like me who've been around for a while. So this question is, how are piano students different now than when you were a student? Uh, can we start with you, Professor Martin? How are piano students different from when you were a student? Um, you know, for as long as I can remember, the sort of the word on the street was pianists are better now than they ever were. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, have you heard Moritz Rosenthal lately? Um, but I, I do believe what happens is that in the last, say, 50 years, the level of teaching somehow has has gone so much higher in terms of processing efficiently processing people who sound good even i want to say they've made people with less talent sound better that's what we've gotten better at in the last 50 years mm. at the time rosenthal was alive it was a sort of survival of the fittest in my idea Mm -hmm. And so people who studied with Lyshetitsky, there were three or four in the ilk of, of uh, Schnabel or Rosenthal, that sort of gifted person who was not going to be stopped no matter what. For every one of those, there were two or three hundred who people don't know anymore. And, if, and some of them quite wonderful. The point is now we've gotten much better at teaching certain things. And what, what I do see that's quite different is um, the more the, the more skilled we get at fixing technical issues, uh, the less musical thought comes into it. This is the only thing that really bothers me, worries me about the future. Because it's not that people are anti-musical or unmusical, but they think if they've arrived at a secure way of hitting all the right notes and possibly following all the instructions they see on the page, they don't often think beyond that. And when I was a student, we thought, I think, I want to say, with more depth, we thought beyond just hitting all the right notes. And that's not the fault of the students from the last 20, 30 years. That's the fault of culture. And uh, starting from the, the recording industry, that from any time from that's the, the first place we can place blame. But now 
you know, with with YouTube and Spotify and all of the media like like they are, what I find as biggest proof that students are better and better and better from the finger down and not from the brain back is um, uh, I, I was talking to a violinist a couple of days ago and, and it's a young kid in the West Coast and she had heard she was playing a um, uh, Mendelssohn introduction and Rondo Capriccioso. And I said, have you heard any great recordings that would give you some ideas? And she said, well, yeah, I, uh, I did. And I, I said, who was it? Who, who were the violinists? And she said, somebody named Maxim Vinegar. And OK, I'm sorry. This is not just a little silly mistake to me. This is a travesty. Anybody who's so stupid that they can't know who Vengeroff is. And in our world, in the piano world, there are so many really dumb people who can play Petrushka. And that's the fault of good teaching in a, ba in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I just find that, yes, yes, we've gotten better at teaching the instrument, which is the easy part, actually. I mean, it's not that hard to figure out why somebody's falling on their face and not hitting, not hitting the right notes. But we've done that too much. We've changed too many diapers. And I find too many really good sounding pianists, superficially sounding, who don't have a musical interior. Mm -hmm. It's the interior life that I'm missing. So I've said my piece. Oh, thank you so much. Um, maybe the same question, uh, Dr. Leone. Yeah, so uh, I, I resonated with some of those things that you just said, Julian. Um, you know, I had the, the privilege of studying with a student of Lechaditsky, so with, with Mieszysław Horshavsky. And um, our lessons were never actually about playing the piano at all. They were lessons in interpretation of the music and understanding how to understand the music. And, um, and of course, I had other teachers who focused on um, the mechanics, but really it, it was always secondary with the teachers, the older teachers that I had. And I remember once I was in a, a, master, a master class with uh, Adele Marcus, and one of the students did something that she didn't agree with, and she said, where did you get that idea? And um, the student said, well, I heard an Ashkenazi recording, and he did that, and she was so indignant, and she said, well, who do you study with, RCA Victor? <laughs> and it was considered, if you listened to recordings, I think that a lot of people considered it to be, you know, sort of cheating. Mm. Nowadays, my students will tell me, well, from all the YouTube recordings I heard, this one does this, this does this, this, and I'm like, I don't really care. Mm. Let's see if we can figure it out together. Let's, let's try to figure out a way to find your voice here. So I think for me, that is a big difference is that uh, students are inundated with interpretations of others. Mm. And um, instead of actually discerning and and gathering those tools that we need to discern what is on the page and how does it relate to other scores that you've studied and you know other uh, non piano music <laughs> so that's the difference I see. excellent would anybody like to add anything to these fine answers was great that was great and very informative so I will move on to the next question and this one is actually quite more straightforward have you always known you wanted to be a piano professor very good question uh, dr. Hong can we start with you <clears throat> You're muted, Dr. Hong. <laughs> okay. Now, hi, everyone. I guess I can't see all of you there, um, but um, I'm so thrilled to be here and with, uh, along with these uh, renowned artists and colleagues and friends uh, so, um, that I admire. So it's uh, really excited. Yeah, um, the question, um, yeah. 
Can you recite the question one more time? <laughs> sure. Have you always in your life known that you wanted to become a piano professor? Um, not. No, there are. There were at some point, like uh, at your age, maybe the when I was little, I had doubts, uh, like thinking, oh, like firefighters or you know doctors, they save life. So what do I do? Do I um, do I have to keep playing music? Can I, you know, influence some people? So I didn't know that uh, the playing piano was um, my thing, but I didn't know that I'll be teaching. But uh, when I started college, and I have to help myself, so um, start teaching, and I uh, right after that I found uh, my joy of teaching and helping people, and I uh, teaching is uh, something I really uh, like to do because uh, it influences students and how they grow, and so maybe like when I start teaching, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher, but I wasn't sure about that I'll be teaching at the college. Uh, all I was doing is uh, what, what I enjoyed to do, I was doing and then keep learning it. And then I came this far. So <laughs> it just happened this way. But uh, what I want to say is I really like what I'm doing, uh, being able to perform and teach. So if anybody uh, have the same passion as I I was when your age, I think you will enjoy what you're doing, teaching at the college. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. That was very informative. Now, a person that I know loves teaching. Same question, Dr. Elisi. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question because uh, I cannot, you know, I can't pinpoint exactly when I, uh, when I may have decided that uh, I was going to pursue a life with music when I was 13 years old, uh, but, <laughs> and I was listening, I think, to um, the Rubinstein recording of the second concerto of Brahms and that music. Uh, did it for me, I suppose, but I cannot pinpoint exactly when the other, uh, you know, decision to uh, uh, of, of teaching came about. I suppose that initially it was, uh, I was at Peabody and I was a student in, in the master's degree, probably starting my second year already, and uh, I suppose I was doing some jobs uh, on weekends also to build my experience, right? And then uh, to work with uh, very young kids. I was very uh, inexperienced. Uh, and so I, I, uh, I tried all various possibilities. Uh, I think that the level of attention of uh, the students was uh, so low. Many of them were doing it for fun, you know? So it was not very uh, pleasing uh, in many ways. I kind of hated it because no one was very serious about learning. And I certainly, uh, you know, I was, but I felt that uh, the young people who, uh, whom I was working with were not. And so that actually cast uh, a lot of doubts. <laughs> you know, but, but what happened is that as time went by and changed various, you know, uh, jobs around the Baltimore area, I also found some intermediate students and it was uh, very interesting to to work on repertoire that that was a little more challenging and also to make plans you know for them so that they would grow with repertoire as well and uh, and then it was very intriguing and i think that one thing led to another uh, but um you know then i started uh, teaching i was a couple of years before graduating i got my first job and the result of that was that i started teaching college students so the repertoire was so it, it's been a weird wind after that and uh, i confess that i haven't um i think that you know my former teacher leon fleischer used to say that you teach the student but you also teach music <laughs> in other words uh, when you teach music there is maybe you can you, you talk to a student about a certain ideal of an artistic level that you're trying to reach you know how you phrase this how you would like to hear it. you cut corners 
to be able to get to that destination. But when you cut corner, you are offering an image that could be, you know, that the student, of course, will have to find a way to, uh, to create something in connection between the distance of where they are and where the image is. And of course, teaching the student means also to help along those ways, you know, to, uh, to get closer to that ideal image. And I think that this act, both the act of discovering maybe a certain ideal place that you would like uh, somebody to, to think about and help the person to, to reach are both uh, two sides of the same coin, except the coins has three sides. And one is simply that the more you teach and the more you learn. Um, and, and so I, I often tell my students that you think that you have learned maybe a couple of things from me, but I learn a lot more from you. And, and <laughs> so one time I did a whole cycle of CP Bach and uh, students played 22 sonatas. I learned a lot about that composer that I didn't know before. So I think that uh, it, both I find teaching is uh, both an act of kindness and an act of selfishness at the same time, <laughs> because you, you also learn a great deal and you, know, and, and you stay in contact with music. So it's something very beautiful. Thank you very much for that. Would anybody like to add to that? Wow, what fantastic answers. Now, this next question, when I first read it, oh, Dr. Garcia, please. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Quack, and thank you, everybody, for being here. It's such a great uh, group of colleagues and participants. I just want to add something in regard to the question that was just asked to, did you know that you wanted to be a piano professor? And the answer I wanted to share with everybody, with the participants, which would be applicable to many of them, is that uh, some of you, uh, all of you, or maybe none of you may know that you, what you want to do. I mean, some of you may just have no clue what you want to do. Do you want to be a performer? Do you want to teach? Do you want to be a, a, a collaborative artist? Do you, I, I mean, you may not have the answer. And I think it's relevant for everybody to know that that's okay. I think that you are right now in a stage that you should do what uh, you should do what you, uh, you should be practicing. <laughs> And you, you, you should be focusing on your life in a way that you should practice. In other words, uh, expose yourself to many creative ways of practicing, right? Um, don't just pick one thing and repeat it over and over, but be creative how you practice. Uh, I was just teaching earlier today and, you know, make an exercise after the exercise, make a piece of the piece, you know, <laughs> play a nocturne like a mazurka, play a mazurka, like, I don't know, just improvise on things, be very creative about it. So parallel to that on your lives, I think that you have to expose yourself to good teaching, to reading art, become a whole individual, well-rounded individual, not just concentrate on piano. And uh, I mean, I I don't listen to piano music anymore, believe it or not. I listen to everything but piano music because I learned so much more from doing that. So going back to the question again, um, you know, when I was younger, I, 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 I wanted to be a concert pianist. That's all I wanted to do. But then when I met my teacher at Peabody, Mr. Martin, then I realized, wow, it's really, it's amazing. I, it's great to be a teacher. I want to do the same thing. And then I, I, I met some of my colleagues and I, I learned that, wow, you can become a professor and still play and teach. And then when I was in, in you know, professor, I learned that, hey, I like doing some administration. So then I you know, became a director and eventually a dean and so on and so forth. I never knew. I mean, when I was 15, I had no clue I was going to be in this path. And I'm very happy in the path I'm right now. But I think what I wanted, what I'm trying to say is immerse yourself in as many experiences that are going to nurture you as a person, as, 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 a, as a professional. And then the path is going to be shown to you if you really focus on the music, on the essence of music, of art, and, and, have, um, and have a mission, a mission of, of working and collaborating and do things for others, not just for yourself, mainly for others. And the path will be shown to you, but be well-rounded in everything that you do. And it's okay to not know what path you may want to follow right now. It's okay. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Uh, Professor Martin, did you want to add something to this? I, if I can do it very quickly, I, I taught three of these people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Washington and Hey Jung, and I was also in charge of Enrico's uh, doctoral. What well, at Peabody in those years, we had a seminar specifically to be sure that they kind of got familiar with the ropes of teaching, and I didn't, of course, watch. Uh, Washington or Hei Jung or, or Sasha, when they were teaching little kids, they were going through that phase where they were making money to pay for their apartments. And most of it was not pleasant. That's what Enrico was talking about. Mm -hmm. But the, they slowly learn the value of actually helping somebody who actually, in the long run, is not going to play the piano at all. But they, they were rewarded by that. And I think that's one of the main issues that you can recognize. I noticed, I knew Enrico was going to be a great teacher from watching him sort things out. And I knew that on weekends, he was teaching people who were really not interesting to him. <laughs> but that's different. That has to do with the phase of life. You know, how you eventually end up is a different thing. A lot of my current students will say, all I know is I don't want to grow up to be a teacher. And that's because they're doing a lot of babysitting. So, you know, there are, there are many, it, it, it's a wealthy, I, I think I'm so blessed to be able to get paid for the thing I love doing. And I think most of us feel that way eventually. But I don't, I don't need to elaborate on this. I just wanted to say, I, I have a little recipe for what, what it takes to be a good teacher. And all of those guys qualify. I think number one you have to like people and you have to be rewarded by making them do something that they couldn't do without you number two you have to have had one lousy teacher and you have to have one really good teacher if you've got that combination you are a good teacher it may take a while to it to for it to all come together but if you have those three ingredients you will be a good teacher so i'll get out of here i will definitely Put that recipe down somewhere because that's a very good one to know. Thank you all. I'm going to move on to the next question because we have some people who are really, really qualified answering this. So, do you think obtaining an uh, artist diploma in addition to the DMA gives students an advantage seeking employment as opposed to only pursuing a DMA? So, is a artist diploma helpful in getting employment? I'm not necessarily talking about a better pianist. And we have our two rising faculty stars. Uh, Dr. Alexander Malikov, who is currently in the middle of his artist diploma, correct? After attaining. So I think he would be perfect person to answer this. Yes, I, uh, I just finished my artist diploma at the Glenn Gould School. And mm -hmm. I have another artist diploma from the Cleveland Institute of Music. Um, <laughs> employment in terms of... Uh, Performing career, is that is that the question? Or... Actually, the word is employment, so that doesn't necessarily mean a tenure track position. That means making a living as a pianist. So, yes, well, an artist diploma allows for um, a, um, one to put themselves out there and form connections. Uh, when I was in Cleveland, I got to um, perform in a lot of. Uh, different series and um, outreach programs and I formed a lot of connections uh, with concert organizers who um, invited me and invited me back and that's very important I think that's uh, the most important thing that comes out of that and same thing here in Toronto I got to know the uh, music world a little bit without having to DMA it's uh, very heavy in terms of um, classes and academic work so there's never enough time to really go out and put yourself out there as a performer. Excellent, thank you. I would also like to ask this question to the other rising faculty star, Dr. Jean Park, who had the DMA and went straight towards the teaching route right now here in Texas. So could you maybe tell us, do you think you would have had an advantage by having a artist diploma? You know, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't have an artist diploma, so who who's to say? Uh, I don't think there's necessarily, you know, we're in a career where there's no there's no straight path. Like you can go and you can get a DMA and you can get an artist diploma and you could still not be employed. Um, we're just in a very kind of uncertain profession that doesn't necessarily have a straight path and not everyone's path is going to be the same. 
Um, I will say though, uh, I think uh, Alexandria was talking about how the artist diploma gave him connections. And I think that um, outside of, you know, knowing what you're doing and being good at what you do and doing all the homework and studying and practicing, um, sometimes it's really just uh, being in the right place at the right time. And also um, just like being a nice person. Uh, because like the two jobs that I have, you know, and I'm just starting out, like I'm really the least qualified person to talk about any of this. Um, but I, my husband got a job in San Antonio. So I moved to San Antonio um, and I had no job here. Um, but my friend who I got a doctorate with um, at Stony Brook, uh, he got a job at San Antonio College um, as a in piano and then another job opened up and so he said well i recommend my friend gene um and so that's how i got a job at san antonio college and then i happened to live across the street from the university of incarnate word and so i just sent the <laughs> chair an uh, email i said hey i live across the street from the university of incarnate word and i am looking for work and you know here's my my CV. And then he said, okay, well, you know, we always need people to company. So I accompanied the vocal students and then somebody left their job at UIW and they liked me enough and they just, hey, do you want to apply for the job? And so sometimes it's just, I don't know. Hmm. I, I don't. <laughs> well, thank you. That's actually a very thorough answer. And if I put both of your answers together. One of the things that I am gathering, and I believe this to be very true, uh, networking, whether it's an artist diploma or DMA is actually quite important because um, without knowing people, you know, and I'm not talking about funny business. I'm just talking about, you know, somebody has heard of you and did something really well. So maybe, um, I didn't hear a clear advantage about an artist diploma. I certainly hear it because of the networking reasons. So thank you both. Would anybody like to add something to that amongst the panelists? Okay. Excellent. Let me move on. Here. Say, yes. Yeah, I was going to just add something oh, as I we, was uh, at the search committee like a few years ago, and then I'll be having another one next year. Uh, what we did, like there are so many, about 200 applicants uh, for the uh, position. And what we did was eliminating people who doesn't have experience, uh, previous experiences. So in, uh, we didn't include those uh, being assistants, uh, having assistantship at the college. Uh -huh. Like anything that if you guys have a opportunity to teach even adjunct at the college experience, those uh, probably help more in a way, because um, what we were looking for was people who had college teaching experience. So anything, and for me, uh, if I didn't have uh, uh, my college uh, adjunct uh, college experience before I applied to this job, I don't think I have gotten it. So they were mm -hmm. looking for people who already have taught. So that might help, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Before we get to Dr. Garcia, I wanna add just a little bit more to the question itself and I want Garcia and also Dr. Lee, I hope we can hear her through a mask. I believe she's getting her vaccination shot in Korea right now, which is fantastic. But the two administrators, I am very curious about what you guys are looking for when it comes to hiring uh, collegiate professors, especially as a, you know, both of you guys as a dean. So Dr. Garcia, maybe that was what you were gonna lead into. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kwak, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I just want to share a little perspective with, with the participants in the festival about hiring um, when you're applying for a position in higher education, it's particularly specific at university. Times have changed. I remember uh, when I came to Texas State, uh, Dr. Quag, you remember our predecessor told us mm -hmm. a famous story how he got his job. He finished his handshake and a coke. He took, you know, shake hands, uh, had a coke as, as the dean for a job, and that's it. Four years later, he was at the institution. Nowadays, that never happened. <laughs> now, having said this, obviously, depending whether you are applying for a job at Juilliard or whether you're applying a job anywhere else or Eastman, you know, it really depends. The, each institution is looking for different 
credentials and things from from individuals but i am going to speak generally speaking for universities not conservatories and i can tell you everything in my from my point of view everything boils down to relationships if you don't know how to work with people if you don't know how to collaborate with people if you don't know how to have great communication skills no matter how great of a pianist you are nobody's going to hire you at least nobody with a brain and i have to say uh, in all the searches I've had that I had to to um, to facilitate, we've had pianists that are absolutely incredible, incredible pianists. Now, I, it, how to define incredible? It's it's I don't want to answer that because I will take a lot more than five, you know, like a minute. But at the end, the ones who had the job, the ones who were offered the job, were those who knew how to do other things than playing the piano. Were you able to communicate? Were you able to, you know, have a festival? Were you able to manage your own recitals? Are you able to be a good mentor to the students? Do you have a great personality? Are you able to communicate clearly? I mean, there's just so many factors. Obviously, the piano, the, the pianism, the, the the artistry always is there. And so it's important. Again, I want to emphasize to, to, to all of those students who are seeking uh, potential careers in higher ed to focus always on the music, on the artistry, but just don't be so, um, um, what is it, uh, focus on one thing that you forget about um, other aspects that are super important, you know, collaborative work, chamber music, playing with singers. I've learned so much more from listening to singing, um, except I have a terrible voice, but you know, those are the things that at the end of the day make, make a difference when you're applying for a job. And also if you're light, I mean, you know, I was, I was working with um, many years ago with a leadership coach and he was mentioning that people know if they like your notes in like, it was like 0 0.07 seconds or something like that. They will know if they like you or not. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you play the best recital in your life. If people don't connect with you, it's a big issue. So uh, be humble, <laughs> uh, be nice, be generous, be kind and be uh, everything else that you need to be to get a good job as far as credentials go. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. So I would like to ask the same question to Dr. Lee. Hopefully we can listen to you through the mask. But the question is, when you are hiring somebody as a administrator, and Dr. Lee is an administrator, one of the most successful universities in Seoul, South Korea, Suk Myung Women's University, what kind of qualities do you look for? I'm sorry, Dr. Lee, we are having a trouble. Maybe it's just me, but we are having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm gathering from both of your answers is you have to be more than just a pianist. There's a lot of good pianists out there. So creating yourself to become that complete package or a very well-rounded person is very important when it comes to attaining jobs. I know all of us know a lot about this. Would anybody like to add anything in addition to attaining a job and some of the qualities that you're looking for? Hey, I don't see any hands up, so thank you very much. May I move to the next question? Okay, this is a very interesting question. You all seem to be having a wonderful career. Have you guys ever hit a slump in your life? And how do you get out of it? It's a very interesting question. 
Uh, let's see. Dr. Rackers, we only got to hear you just a little bit. Full professor at Eastman School of Music, so it doesn't seem like you've ever hit a slump in your life. <laughs> well, um, I think that I think that what happens as, as you go along is that you find yourself needing to emphasize different things at different times in what you're doing. So uh, I feel less like you might hit a slump in general and more like you might hit a slump in one area or another. So, you know, for example, when I was finishing my doctorate and the sole object of one year was applying for every available job. I think I applied for maybe 50 jobs the year that I graduated. Those were those were the days when there actually were 50 jobs. But uh, I didn't play the piano very much that year. Uh, and it was depressing. And so I would call that a slump. There wasn't that much time to practice. And most of the practice that I did was a very small amount of repertoire, hoping that I would get an, an interview. So making sure that I had something capable to play uh, for an interview. So I think it's most likely to go through a slump in, in playing from my experience. Uh, I think also, depending on how much we're teaching, uh, it's possible to get in over one's head with teaching. Um, there was a point of time when I was teaching about 35 hours a week, and uh, that was too much for me. So that led to a slump, a little bit of a slump um, in playing. I mean, if, if we're playing 50 concerts a year, that can lead to a little bit of a slump uh, in teaching. Maybe we get tired. Uh, maybe we get a little bit of burnout. So I think that it's really important to have balance, especially after school. When we're in school, our job is to practice. Uh, and then our job is to find a way uh, to enter the profession that we're in. And then our job is to find the right balance. And I think each of us has to have our own formula for what the right balance is. But I think that having the right balance will avoid uh, slumps. And when, when it gets uh, too far in one direction or another, depending on the person, it can, uh, it can lead to a slump. So um, thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, you know, most of us would never imagine Dr. Carol Leone ever having a slump in her career. So we are a little curious. Dr. Leone, would you say you've ever had a slump in your career? I think so. I think I'm going to say a slump in my progress as a pianist. And I, and what I when I look back, I think those were the times that I had the biggest jump in learning afterwards. So if you hit a snag and you say, oh, come on, I'm entering competitions and I'm not getting the response that I used to get, or um, I don't have the same kind of satisfaction in my playing that I, that I did last year or whatever, um, it's usually because there is something that you are in the middle of processing and learning. Maybe you got some new information from a teacher and you're trying to integrate things. Um, in fact, I, I, I had sort of a strange, I didn't plan this, but in my 20s, I had many different teachers and it did cause some confusion. But I found that once I had some time to myself with no teacher, suddenly all that became integrated in my mind better and my playing suddenly made a jump so i guess what i want to say is if someone is concerned about a slump in their playing it probably means that improvement is right around the corner wow. <laughs> excellent thank you so much would anybody else like to add anything to that question about having a slump? That's actually a very interesting question. If I could add just a little bit myself, just like many people over here, I did my standard schooling, a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and went directly into a doctorate degree. I was one of the very fortunate ones that actually got a tenure track job before I even finished my doctorate degree. So my first year as a tenure track professor, 
I was doing my last year as a doctorate student. This wasn't the greatest thing because like a lot of people, that first job, number one, people didn't really know what a piano professor is supposed to be like. And number two, they abused you quite a bit. Uh, my life was very difficult in the sense that, you know, when I came to Texas State, we have a class piano specialist, we have a jazz specialist, uh, pedagogy specialist, literature specialist. My first job, that was all me for the entire school. Plus, I was basically their staff accompanist for all their juries and recitals. And um, what's tricky about that is not only are you tremendously overworked, but People don't know that they're really abusing you. They don't know. And that still goes on all the time. I remember Dr. Rabot, you know, told me about one of her job interviews. They asked her how big her left hand is so they could see if she could play Hindemith trombone sonatas. I mean, horrifying to hear questions like this. That was a period of definite slump for me because I found myself practicing Strauss horn concertos all the time and I really had to work trying to you know establish my scholarly and creative activities to attain that very important tenure while trying to get to another position because I knew I certainly could not last like this. So that was my tenure but I know it was an important role in my life because that was what I needed to do to get to that next step. So excellent question. Thank you very much. Now we're going to a question that is very different. <laughs> How does one prepare for an audition? And what do you look for in a prospective candidate? You know, considering everything like playing skills, attitude, repertoire list, resume. Can we start with you, Professor Martin? What do you look for in a student that is auditioning? Um, I guess in terms of controlling the instrument is important, knowing that that there is a clear idea, a clear musical sense, and that the execution is, is I, I don't want to use the word flawless, that's not as important, but untroubled, let's say, untroubled technically, but full of ideas. The, the energy level produced by somebody who has musical ideas and also plays the piano well is very different than somebody who goes through all the motions of hitting all the right notes. I, I keep harping on that, but obviously I'm hearing way too much playing where people hit all the right notes and I just as soon not hear it. Actually, I'd rather not hear it. Now and then I look forward to a wrong note just because all the right notes get so uninteresting sometimes. So in an audition, what stands out is, is the vivacity, the aliveness of how some someone communicates with with some intelligence taste judgment all of those things and controlling the instrument controlling the instrument is important but now more and more a lot of people can control the instrument and that's not what sets them apart it's would you consider wanting to pay money to hear that person that's always in the back of my mind when i'm wow picking people that i would i think are really really worth contributing to Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Alisi, same question. What do you listen for when you're when somebody's auditioning for you? You are muted, Dr. Alisi. Obviously, it was going to happen to me, to me as well, so I can finally shush a little bit. <laughs> but basically, uh, like uh, like Julian Martin said, I wouldn't look for anything that is weight related in terms of, uh, <laughs> um, you know, power of playing or display or, or you know, uh, I'd like to see the inside, inside out. I'd like, I don't, I, I, it's just personal taste for me. I don't, uh, you know, I don't particularly like uh, performances that seem to stumble on on a superficial aspect uh, and which is also part of uh, trying to hit all the right notes so to speak right and 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 making that one of the goals uh, uh, and i do remember actually uh, that i had a student uh julia martin will will love this story who got into julia 
and he was obsessed with hitting in the uh, octave etude of of, um, of Chopin. He was obsessed, and every time he missed one note at the end of the performance, he would say, "Ah, there goes my Julia audition," you know. And then he would go and practice some more. And finally, <laughs> anyway, so this is just uh, uh, somehow in his mind he had created this, you know, that this is the standard that you, know, you really cannot miss one note. Uh, and so, yes, I think I would love to actually, in a few minutes, and I know that the stop and start is extremely difficult for everybody, but I would love to have a sensitive understanding of what goes on inside the person and how affectionate the person is, truly, with the repertoire she or he plays. A repertoire that is effectively communicated something because, you know, uh, Ivo Pogorelic used to say, you know, you have become the notes and the notes have become you. Uh, and in some ways, there is a certain truth to this idea that when you play a piece, you have become the piece and the piece has been ingrained into you to the point that you are the same thing. And so that I can see a little bit through the filter of that uh, personality in some ways, some elements that are a little bit different, but not different for the sake of being different, because a true artistic performance does not imitate so many different things uh, or, or try this because nobody tried it again by having listened to 20 different performances uh, in recordings. Uh, and at all costs, having to come up with that idea. It, it's an idea that is, is uh, very organic and it's, it is produced by being truly in love with the music that you play and being truly attached to it, because that makes you dig a little deeper into the piece. And in that way, uh, maybe you are able to, to show a little bit of yourself too, I think. And that's that's. Thank you so much. For. May I also hear the opinion? What do you listen for when people are auditioning for you? Lost you for just a second. Can you say the name one more time? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I would love to hear Dr. Lomasov. Uh, what do you listen for when people are auditioning for you? I I, I really wouldn't add uh, much to what uh, my wonderful colleagues have already uh, expressed so so vividly. Mm -hmm. You 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 want to hear if somebody has something to say and. I, I wouldn't want that to be as a, as a kind of incentive for you to start gushing. Um, I, I'm not too fond of gushers, people who, who just kind of go with the stream of consciousness over the top kind of, and well, that's how I feel. That's, that's not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, if you have something to say, it's a, it's a, a particular mix of of knowing what the style is, um, uh, analyze, having analyzed the piece and, and, and thought about it, and knowing how you feel about it and how to keep that in proportion to all the other aspects of, of studying the piece. And that's, it's tricky, it's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's why it's not that common, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I look for. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to add to those fine answers? Doc, oh, Professor Martin, yes. Yes, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of, um, I'm, I'm not muted, right? You hear me? Yes, yes. You, you do hear me? Yes. I, I wanted to just say, um, you know, if, if, if we remember what Dr. Leone was saying that in her 20s, she had a lot of different teachers, but with all of them, it was really not about playing the piano. That's something she had to sort out for herself and ha with her own sense of integrity, deal with those issues. But the teachers that she had were only interested with interpretation. And I, I have, uh, uh, well, I just want, I think one thing that we're not discussing is that we're all storytellers. The art in what we do is mm -hmm. telling stories. And there are so many ways of telling stories, but what you must be able to do is speak well. You have to 
look at your own imagination and think if I'm telling a story about a dog running into my house unexpectedly, how am I going to frame that story? Anything, absolutely any silly thing. Because music ranges from that to the profound and even sillier than that example. But for me, words are so important in able, being able to explain what you want to do. As uh, Dr. Lomasov said, that the, the idea of gushing is people who get a certain level of skill with the instrument think, well, what we do on top is just sort of push it on like a wedding cake. And then the more you push it on the cake, the better you're supposed to be, which is a revolting idea. Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry to have strong words, but isn't that Love disgusting? <laughs> okay, so I just I think we have to remember that we're storytellers and we use our ears and our fingers to do it. And then hopefully that convinces people. Thank you so much. That's great. All right, here is another question that I think we will have a lot of people answer really well. What is more important, the teacher or the prestige of the school? It's a very interesting question. Ah, uh, let's see. Dr. Rabotkina, what is more important when you look at a pianist, the teacher or the prestige of the school? For me, that's not really a... A doubtful. Oh, so you're one hundred percent. One hundred percent teacher, uh, because you're developing your personality. You're developing something precious that only you have, and you need to be connected. You need to be in really good hands. It's very important. It's not necessarily that your teacher will be the best musician or whatever that means. If there is such thing objectively. <laughs> But you need to connect to, to that person. I think it's very important. Excellent. Thank you. So if I could just rephrase this a little bit more commonly. Number one university or conservatory with their number three teacher. Or do you go to number four university or conservatory that has a teacher that you absolutely love? Which one is better? So. Maybe, uh, Dr. Garcia, what do you think is more important? You know, I think both are important. It really depends what part of your life you are in. And uh, uh, to me, I will always remember when I was uh, young and tender, <laughs> I studied with uh, Marilyn Neely a few weeks. Mm -hmm. I was a Catholic university and I received a letter from, from Peabody. And the letter said, you've been accepted by Peabody and you have a choice of three teachers. And, and Mary Lynn Neely immediately said, oh, you must study with Julian. Absolutely, you have to study with Julian Martin. And I trusted her and, and I did. And it was, it was the most amazing and wise decision I've ever made in my entire life because uh, Julian changed my life. Uh, continues to change my life. He continues to teach me. So I, I think to me at the time, absolutely was the right thing to be for me to be with Julian. And if I had to go back in time, I would still do it. Uh, having said that, also in that time, uh, I, I grew up in Ecuador. I was born in Ecuador and I went for, I attended my undergraduates um, at the National Conservatory of Music in Ecuador. Nobody knows there isn't a conservatory of music in Ecuador. Some people may not know. So nobody cares I went to, to there. But, you know, when they hear Peabody, it does trigger something uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so I think it's a combination of both. And it depends on what stage of your life are in and what you're looking for. Um, however, having said that, if I have to choose one, it has to be the teacher for sure. I think that's a priority. So... Maybe perhaps I can ask, um, maybe I could ask Dr. Leone. Dr. Leone, please forgive my language, but how important is the sexiness of the school? I hope that makes sense. I, I think that um, Washington is right. It really does depend on what time of your life you are. If you're thinking about, this is my DMA and I definitely want to go um, into academia. 
it might be important where you get that DMA in terms of, you know, a brand name. If you're a high school senior and you're looking to develop and, and discover whether this is going to be your passion for your life and find that direction, then you really, then the teacher is the most important thing. You have to have someone to partner with you, to develop you, to, you know, move you forward. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, it depends also if you want to just be a performer and you don't want to ever be in academia, well, what's on your resume in terms of which school you went to is less important, right? It's how you play. So I, I think it depends on what you're trying to do with your career and at what point in your career you are. And if I can flip the question, thank you, Dr. Leone. If I can flip the question towards the faculty members itself, um, themselves, if you are on a search committee, how important is the school of the candidate that you're looking at? Uh, Dr. Elisi, I'll ask you, how important is the school when you're looking at a candidate? Well, this, it's a secondary question that is connected to the first question and makes perfect sense. They almost go hand in hand. And I really can't add much to what has been already said, except that I would like, you know, I always say it takes two to tandem. And, uh, and I feel that there is one additional element. And when you ask also if it's more important the teacher or if it's more important the school or both, uh, I think there is another element. I think you are most important because you only can squeeze out of that teacher and that school all the possibility that the people and an institution have to offer. So I think that without a very strong uh, inner direction, inner need uh, to uh, bait yourself as much as possible in, in multiple opportunities and, and, and learn as much as you can and consider also that learning a, a lifelong journey and not just, you know, getting a degree and hopefully from then on I move to the next thing, but continue to keep that precious uh, development for yourself, you know, uh, very well in sight. And of course, there is all that side of the business of music surrounding it, it mm -hmm. but don't let it interfere with that core because that is the core that guides you to make all the choices that you're going to make also. Uh, and, and I think that in answer to the second question, um, in many ways, it is assumed that uh, maybe a more prestigious institution will have uh, a lot of offers, uh, will be more up to date to a lot of different developments because, you know, uh, maybe the institution has also the financial power to attract different people and do different master classes and, and different. But again, who are these people who are doing the master classes? They are chosen maybe by a faculty, right? So it's the faculty that makes such decisions that brings so much variety for the students to take advantage of. Uh, so it's it's a really it's a really tough one because you know actually in about 2015 or so I looked at jobs around and and I actually noticed that most of the people who were getting jobs uh, they they were from Lawrence University or mm -hmm. or uh, uh, universities that are not uh, among the top tier institutions the majority were not from top tier institutions I can tell you that I studied quite a lot about that and and I was very surprised so then I asked myself oh that's interesting Mm -hmm. uh, it may very well be that sometimes uh, you have to put up with, you have to become an, a person who is understanding of where you are applying for the job as opposed to firing out, you know, like a standard uh, letter that goes for, for every job. And, and I've seen actually some such letters, I must say, I won't tell you from which major institution that basically said, I am the ideal candidate for the job. And this person was applying in Georgia. 
without any understanding of what was going on there uh, and how this letter might be perceived uh, you know, in the South, for example. So I think that it, it's, a, it's a really difficult question. It, it may help somebody get an understanding of how much you have acquired from these institutions but ultimately, it's it's uh, you know you can always say you can always see by the way who has been very very lazy and has done very very little, notwithstanding the major institution and all the opportunities and maybe and possibilities. You can look at these resumes and they only look to me like school resumes. So you have been at school, but everybody went to school. So what is the difference then? What are you listing? What have you done? What else have you done? I don't see much of of that. You know, so you can see. Uh, you can see tremendously built resume with so much fantasy and so many ideas and so many opportunities that students have taken. And you see them from both students who went uh, to, uh, you know, most prominent schools to less prominent schools. So as, and again, you see, so that's why I'm saying the accentuation, if I may say, <laughs> it's on you. It's on what you do with all the possibilities that gravitate around you. And so this is the triumph of the individualism for me that is most important. Thank you very much, Dr. Alisi. Okay, before we get to the final one, I want to do one thing. Andrew, would you mind spotlighting Dr. So Young Yoon for me? Okay. I wanted to do this, guys, because Dr. Yoon, who is an excellent friend of mine, I wanted to just tell you a little bit. Um, we went to school together at University of Texas doing our doctorate degree, and she got her degree from Professor Anton Nell. Then afterwards, she decided she liked Anton so much, she decided to go after Anton's teacher. <laughs> so she went and got her artist diploma over at Cincinnati. Right now, currently a professor of piano over at Seoul Cyber University, but more than that, she runs the most efficient, famous, big-time chamber music society in Seoul, South Korea. And if you guys know the music scene in Seoul, South Korea, you know that's not an easy scene to break into. I was fortunate enough to be invited by her a couple of times and get to play at Seoul Art Center like it's nothing. And I remember all those that's wonderful true. moments. So, so she today wanted to just come by and just listen. So if you guys... This is what was happening, uh, Doctor. Everybody was mentioning to me, "You haven't chosen so young yet." I'm going. No, this is by her choice. <laughs> so oh I just God, wanted her to have a chance. Really nice, Jason Opa. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, I'm guys, so enjoying this listen right now. So oh, let me good. just be uh, quiet. Please. Okay, absolutely. So I wanted to make sure that I wanted to acknowledge her because we have really <laughs> wonderful faculty that was getting. <laughs> uncomfortable that I didn't choose you <laughs> or ask you the right <laughs> question. And they kept asking me, why haven't you done it yet? <laughs> oh, okay. So um, I just wanted to ask this one final question and anybody can jump in because we have various different generations of piano teachers right now. If there's the one most important advice that you would like to offer to the students, your own personal advice, what would it be? Uh, I'm just going to pick randomly. Dr. Malikov, can we start with you? What is one advice that you could give towards the students? Oh my goodness. Wow. That's uh, <laughs> put me on the, yeah, on the spot there. Um, I think just really be honest with yourself. Be honest with the repertoire you play, play pieces that you love. Um, Everything that we talked about, especially uh, in choosing what schools to go next to, what who to study with, be very honest with what you really love, and go go for that. Go for the gut feeling, sort of the yeah, the inner inner guidance. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. I, absolutely, you got to be honest. Don't play pieces that you can't play, <laughs> and if you know it. <laughs> um, also, uh, maybe I won't go through everybody, but but. Would anybody else like to answer that question? Uh, or not a question, just an advice. Would anybody like to offer our participants this year any advice that has maybe helped you in life? I'd like to just share 
sorry, Dr. Leone, please go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> I would say uh, be transparent, um, be respectful, focus on relationships, building good relationships, listen to understand others, you know, focus on share, share success. You win, I win, we win. And also tell the truth. I think those are some values that are very important as you continue to build your career in life. Thank you. And Dr. Leone? I would just like to um, encourage everyone to always have self-care in mind and to never sacrifice yourself too much. Um, in other words, to be a whole musician, one needs to be a whole person. And it's very important as an artist to, to develop a sense of self, a sense of love for oneself and acceptance for oneself. We're, we are in a business in which perfection is um, the name of the game, it seems. But that's actually not the most important thing. Excellence, absolutely, excellence is essential. Um, but we can't sacrifice our, our own selves for perfection. Um, it's just very important to keep building one's emotional and mental resources um, so that you can be the best that you can be. And if you are in a situation where you're, you have too much anxiety or, or even depression, which comes out of anxiety, um, that is something you want to really avoid. So build your skills for self-care, just like you build your technique. Excellent. One thing that I wanted to just add on to all of this is back in 1991, I developed a friendship back then, doctor, but just Marina Lomasov. And it was, I was so intimidated, but it was the nice person in the world. I was a freshman, she was a junior. And here we are 30 years later, and we still have a personal and a professional relationship. One of my best advice is be nice. If somebody's going to be a jerk to you, of course you can react the way you're going to, but it really is worthwhile being nice because you never know where friendships can lead. Like for us, like this. The time in 2009 when I met this really good Bach player named Enrico Elisi, and we still spend like every week at least talking or texting weekly. And it's a professional and a, a personal relationship that I really, really treasure. So anyways, would anybody like to put a last word to any of this? We are right at the timing that I was thinking because we got started a little bit late, but checking for hands one last time. Well, panelists, thank you so much. It is our honor to have you here as faculty members of the 11th Texas State International Piano Festival. It's a lot of fun things are going, like I said, with the exception of some login issues. Everything's going smoothly and there's been some incredible recitals. Oh my God, was Ryan good today. Julie, <laughs> Ryan was so good today. And we just had wonderful recitals and master classes and this was great. So thank you all. Thank you all participants and auditors who are joining in. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody the rest of the week. Thank you all. Thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.